You know, one of the more difficult parts of our walk with Christ, I believe, is persisting in prayer. We'll pray once. We may even pray twice, but praying persistently is something that we struggle with. And I think that's why Jesus tells this parable that we'll see today in Luke chapter 18. But this parable here in Luke 18 is a bit different. You know, sometimes when we read some of Jesus' parables, we read them and go, what in the world is Jesus talking about? Who is this character? What does this character represent? I'm really confused. And sometimes we have to read all the way through the parable and, and almost wait for Jesus to explain it to us. But that's not this way in Luke 18. Luke 18 tells us right up front what this parable is all about. Jesus tells his disciples that they need to pray and not lose heart. Jesus wants us to pray with persistence. And now here we are some 2,000 years after Jesus says these words and we are wondering How in the world can I pray with persistence? What does it look like for me to pray always and not lose heart? Why do I struggle to pray always and not lose heart? Jesus, you're the master. You're the master teacher. How can I do this in my life? And we read these words that Jesus says here in Luke 18 and we wonder... Is my faith as strong as it needs to be? Is that why I'm struggling to pray and not lose heart? Or maybe the reason that we struggle to pray and not lose heart is because we're not entirely convinced that prayer actually works. So when prayer doesn't work, we give up really, really easy. But Luke 18 reminds us, it's important because it does remind us, that God does hear prayer. It reminds us that God does answer prayer. But it also tells us how often Jesus wants his disciples to pray. That Jesus wants his disciples to pray and not lose heart. That's what he's teaching his disciples here in Luke 18, where he gives his disciples two commands And then that long parable that takes up most of our text today. Two commands in one parable. Let's go ahead and read Luke 18, verses 1 through 8 together. Luke 18, verses 1 through 8, where it reads, Now he, that's Jesus, told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not give up. And there was a judge in a certain town who didn't fear God or respect people. And a widow in that town kept coming to him, saying, Give me justice against my adversary. And for a while he was unwilling, but later said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or respect people, yet because this widow keeps pestering me, I will give her justice so that she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. Then the Lord said, listen to what the unjust says. Will not God grant justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay in helping them? I tell you that he will swiftly grant them justice. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? That first command that we read here in Luke chapter 18 is that we need to pray Always. You know, sometimes we read Jesus' words uh, to pray always and we think, wait a second here, Jesus. I got to work. I got to pay the mortgage. I got to pay the rent. I have to put food on my table. Or maybe we think, I got school. I have homework. I have extracurricular activities. How in the world am I supposed to pray always and not give up? And I think that's a good question. So maybe the question we need to be asking ourselves here in the text is, what does it mean to pray always? 
And that's why I think the example of Jesus in his life and in his ministry is so important even for us today. Because we see Jesus in his life and during his ministry take time to go to weddings. We see Jesus take time to eat. So Jesus did some things besides praying in his ministry. But Luke also tells us that Jesus was praying as he came out of the waters at his baptism. There in Luke chapter 3 and verse 20. Luke chapter 5 and verse 16 tells us that Jesus went often into deserted areas to pray. Luke chapter 6 tells us he prayed before choosing the 12 disciples. Luke chapter 9 tells us that Jesus was praying as Peter made that great confession. Luke was praying, or Jesus was praying there in Luke chapter 9, verse 28 and 29 at the transfiguration. Luke prayed, or Jesus prayed before going to the cross there in Luke chapter 22. You see, as we read Jesus' life in ministry here in the Gospel of Luke, one of the things we see is that Jesus is always praying. And here's the point I think Luke is trying to teach us as disciples of Christ here today. That if Jesus, the Son of God, needed to pray always, then don't his disciples need to pray too? You see, by his example and with his teaching, Jesus showed his disciples what it meant to pray always and not lose hope. Jesus shows us by his example and with his teaching that prayer isn't an optional activity for disciples of Christ. Prayer is a necessity. But make no mistake, Jesus or God does not need our prayers. He wants us to pray, but he doesn't need our prayers. But we do. We need to pray always and not give up. And yet so often in our own lives, prayer is a last resort. Prayer is that thing we do when the doctor comes in and says there's nothing else we can do. That's when we finally decide to pray. Pray is the thing that we decide to do when the the boss comes in and says, I'm sorry, the economy's been rough. You know that. I know that. I'm sorry. We're going to have to lay you off. And finally, we start praying for that new job. Prayer is that thing we do when our child or our friend or our neighbor walks away from God And we don't know what to do, so we finally pray. Prayer is like a last resort so many times in our life. But that's not what Jesus says here in the text. Jesus challenges us, his disciples, to keep praying and not lose heart. We need to keep crying out to God. We need to keep praying to God. And I think this is a message that the early church took to heart. In Acts chapter 1, Acts is basically the sequel to the Gospel of Luke. In Acts chapter 1, the disciples, after Jesus has been crucified, he's been dead, and he's been raised, the disciples in Acts chapter 1 are praying. And in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, after Peter has preached that first gospel sermon and 3,000 have come to know Christ, the disciples are devoted to prayer. In Acts chapter 6, when there's this crisis in the church and the apostles are wondering what in the world are we going to do, they tell the church, guys, we're going to remain devoted to the message of the gospel and to prayer. And later in the book of Acts, when Peter is arrested and he's thrown in jail, do you want to guess what the early church did? And I think it seems by the context they seem to be doing it all night long. They prayed. And now, oh, by the way, spoiler alert, Peter was released from jail. And if we were to take a moment to read all of the book of Acts today, we would see that the early disciples, the early church, (laughs) prayed all the time. It was the foundation of their walk with God. But what was so foundational for the early Christians 
has become a secondary or optional activity for us today. That we only pray when we have the time. We only pray when we have the energy. We only pray when there's nothing more pressing to do. We only pray right before we go to bed and uh, then we fall asleep while we're praying. Like, who hasn't had that happen to them at least once in their life? Right here, uh, it's happened. We woke up two hours later going, where has the time gone? We only pray when there's nothing else to do. But that wasn't the case there in the early church. And that's not what Jesus is trying to teach us here in Luke chapter 18. He challenges us. He commands us to pray all the time. And so how can you and I, how can disciples of Christ today have this kind of prayer life? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is we need to discipline ourself. We need to train ourselves to pray, to take time out of our schedules. However busy we may be, we need to take time out of our schedules to pray. Maybe in the morning, maybe at night, maybe at morning, noon at night, but we need to take time to pray. But I think we also need to make time to pray regularly. And for me, my mind goes to the example of Daniel, whose prayer life was so regular, whose prayer life was so habitual, that even his own enemies knew when Daniel would be praying, and they used that to trap him. Do I have the prayer life of Daniel? Do we have the prayer life of Daniel? Do we have the prayer life of Christ? That's the kind of prayer life Jesus expects from us. He expects us to pray all the time. But that second command we see there in the text is that we need to pray and not give up. Look there in verse 1, he tells us, pray always, pray and not give up. And that's hard for us. It's a challenge for so many of us. Because if we're honest with ourselves, we're not entirely convinced that prayer actually is powerful. And because we're not convinced that prayer isn't powerful, then we give up really easy and we stop praying. But Jesus knew that. I think Jesus understood that it would be difficult for you and I, even 2,000 years later, to pray always and not give up So he tells us this parable. He leaves this parable behind so we would learn to pray and not give up. But this is really difficult for us today, really challenging us for us today, because we live in a microwave society that when we come home from work after a long day at the office, dinner's ready in a minute. Because we can stick in one of those microwavable dinners that tastes really nasty. We can stick it in, and a minute later, dinner is ready. If we have leftovers, we can stick leftovers in, and a minute later, it's ready all because of the microwave. And if we don't like what we have in the fridge, and we don't want to eat that microwavable dinner, guess what? We have an app on our phone for Chick-fil-A, and we can order Chick-fil-A, And it's going to be ready for us the moment we walk in the door. And we're not going to have to wait in the line. As Americans, we hate waiting. We want what we want when we want it. And when we don't get it, we give up and we stop praying. But Jesus tells his disciples, don't give up. Don't stop praying. And isn't that a challenge for us today? I mean, how many of us have the prayer life of Zechariah? We looked at Zechariah in our back adult classrooms a couple of weeks ago. Think about Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, who had no doubt been praying for years and years and years and years for a child. And they probably felt like giving up. After all, they're getting old, they're getting advanced in years, and they still haven't had the child that they prayed for until Zachariah's in the temple one day, and an angel appears to him and says, your prayer has been answered. You're going to have a son, and he's going to go before the Messiah. 
What a marvelous feeling for Zechariah. Because Zechariah learned there in that moment, even though his faith was not what it should have been in that moment, Zechariah learns that persistent prayer pays off. If we look at Scripture, if we look at all of Scripture, Genesis to Revelation, which we won't do this morning because that would mean I would be preaching until midnight, we see example after example after example of people who prayed and prayed and prayed and never gave up. And God heard their prayers. So why do we give up praying so easily today? Could one of the reasons we give up praying so easily today be because we haven't stopped to think about all the times that God has in fact answered our prayers? How that time where we were sick and we needed to be healed, that we prayed to God and God answered our prayer for healing. How we got laid off and we prayed for a job and God provided that job so we could provide for our families. How we prayed for a child like Zachariah. And after years and years and years of praying, we could finally see the little baby there on the ultrasound. How often... Have we prayed for an opportunity to share the gospel with a friend or a family member or a co-worker or a neighbor, someone we care deeply about? We've prayed for that door of opportunity to be opened. And lo and behold, that door flies wide open like a garage door on a Sunday afternoon. That door is open and we can walk straight through it. I think one of the reasons we give up and stop praying so easily is we've never stopped and thought about how many times God has answered our prayer. And because we haven't stopped to think about how many times God has answered our prayer, we give up. But if we know God answers prayers... If we take a moment to look at our life and our prayer life and the prayers that we've prayed to God, knowing that he has answered them, then why do we struggle to pray? Could it be that even today that we're too confident in our own abilities so we don't think we need to pray? Could it be that life has just become one big routine? Wake up, go to work come home, eat dinner, go to bed. Wake up, go to work, come home, eat dinner, go to bed. What, what if life has become one big routine and we don't think we need God to, to pray to God to provide for us and to help us and to strengthen us? We don't think we need to pray for God's glory like we talked about last week. Could it be that the reason we don't pray always, the reason we give up prayer so easily is our faith isn't what it should be? And maybe that's where we're at this morning. Maybe we've prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And it doesn't seem like our words are getting past the roof over our heads. And our faith is weakening and we're beginning to give up. And if that's where we're at this morning, Jesus has a word for us here in Luke 18 and verse 1. It's short, it's sweet, it's simple. Look there in verse eight, chapter 18 and verse 1 again, where Jesus tells them this parable on the need to pray always and not give up. That's Jesus' message to the disciples in the first century, and that's his message to us today. Keep praying. And don't give up. Think about that for a second. Is there a prayer in your life, in my life, that we've stopped praying? Is there something in our life that we've stopped praying for? Think about that. Is there something in your life, in my life, 
that we've stopped to pray for. Maybe we've stopped praying for this church to grow. Maybe we've stopped praying for the kingdom to grow, thinking to ourselves, no one cares about the gospel anymore. Maybe we've stopped praying for that sick family member. Maybe we've stopped praying for that job, thinking that God doesn't care about us. Whatever the case, what prayer have we stopped praying for? And look back there at Luke 18 and verse 1. What Jesus is teaching us to pray always and not give up. Jesus tells us that there is power, tremendous power in persistent prayer. So what would happen in our prayer lives if we've started praying for that person, that soul, that sick individual in our life? What would happen if we started praying for them again? What would happen for the kingdom if we started praying for the kingdom to grow? What would happen to this church if we started praying that God would be glorified through this church family? Jesus tells tells us there is power in persistent prayer. You know, sometimes in our lives as humans, we get a little bit annoyed when someone's a bit too persistent. I'm dealing with that right now with my insurance guy. I get a call from the insurance guy about once a month, it seems like, sometimes even multiple times in a week. And he'll call and try to upsell me on whatever product. And I'm thinking to him, dude, dude, you got life insurance, you got car insurance, you got house insurance. I like, I'm worth more dead than alive because of you. Like, the last thing I want to do right now is to buy another insurance product from you. And it's to the point now, he called last week. I saw his, like, oh, that's the insurance guy. I'm not picking up the phone because he's just a wee bit too persistent. But it's not that way with God. God doesn't get annoyed when his people pray persistently. The creator in heaven of earth is not like you and I. That when we cry out to God, we pray persistently. We were crying out to our creator, the one who breathed life into our lungs. The one whose voice spoke the universe into existence. And we are crying out to him and asking for him to help us. Do we realize how incredible This is that even when we as feeble, flawed humans may have tuned out, the creator of heaven and earth hasn't. He still hears our prayers. That's why we pray always. That's why we never give up because God still listens. And then Jesus closes with the third thing, with a parable on prayer. It appears I hit my clicker one too many times. Parable on prayer, beginning there in verse 2 and going all the way through verse 8. You know, sometimes parables can be confusing. We talked about that earlier. They can be a bit shocking. And we can be left to wonder, what in the world is the point? What is Jesus trying to teach us? What am I supposed to do with this? This is really puzzling. And on the surface, it's that way with this parable. Because in this parable that Jesus tells us here in Luke chapter 18 and verse 2, there's this judge in a certain town who doesn't fear God or respect people. You know, that's a judge we all want to appear before, one that doesn't fear God and respect people. He, on, on the surface, he looks like a terrible human being. And then there's this widow Now, keep in mind, widows in the ancient world, they didn't have Social Security. They didn't have Medicare. They didn't have Medicaid. They didn't have 401Ks. They didn't have their husbands or their own pensions. They were at the mercy of others. They needed others to help them. And so when this widow comes before the judge asking for justice against her adversary, the judge says, no, why why would I give you justice? But she keeps coming after him. Again and again and again in verse 3. Give me justice, give me justice, give me justice. And for a while this, uh, this evil judge 
won't give in until finally, until finally he is broken down because the widow kept pleading and pleading and pleading. And this unrighteous judge gives in and gives her justice just because she is persistent. And so we're left wondering, what in the world is Jesus trying to teach us? I think this is the message that Jesus is trying to teach us here in this parable. That if an evil, unrighteous judge gives in because someone is persistent, then what about a good and righteous God? Won't he give in when his people are persistent? That's the message of this parable. But this week I came across four lessons Four simple lessons, I think, that will help us in our prayer life. Four simple lessons that I think will help us pray with persistency. The first one is there in verse 1. Again, pray consistently. Pray and never give up. But that second one is found there in verse 3 and verse 4, and that's to pray humbly. Remember, the widow doesn't have any rights. She knows she doesn't have any rights because she knows the culture she lives in. But she still continually humbled herself before that unjust, that evil judge. But today, as we pray, we're not coming before an evil, unjust judge. We're coming before a just and righteous judge. The creator of all the earth who wants us, who begs us to come before him in prayer. And when we do, we need to come before him humbly. The third thing I see here in the text is we need to come before him boldly. We need to pray boldly. This widow didn't have rights. She had no business staying before a judge in that time frame. But she still boldly and persistently came before that judge to plead her case. And today, we can boldly come before our judge because of Jesus. Who died for our sins, who gave his life as a sacrifice for our sins. And the Hebrew writer says, because everything Jesus has done on the cross we can boldly go before his throne. The fourth and final lesson that I think will help us improve our prayer life and pray persistently is that we need to pray desperately. You see, the widow here in Luke 18 doesn't stand a chance. She knows she doesn't stand a chance. She knows she has nowhere else to turn, and she is desperate So she desperately begs this judge over and over and over and over again. Please, judge, give me justice against my adversary. She's desperate because that judge in that town is the only one who can give her justice. And yet I think one of the things that keeps us from praying with persistence is the fact that we don't realize how desperate We need God's help. That we are too confident in our own strength, so we don't realize how desperately we need God's power. That we don't realize the depth of our sin, so we don't realize how desperately we need a Savior. And this parable teaches us to always pray to keep on praying even when it doesn't seem like there is an answer because God, unlike that unjust judge, is loving, is gracious, is good, is kind, and he listens to our prayers. That's why we pray always. That's why we pray and we don't give up because we know our creator, our father in heaven. We'll talk about that a little more tonight loves us. We know he cares for us and we know he hears us. We pray always and never give up because we know a day is coming 
verse 8, when the Son of Man will return. A day is coming when Jesus will return. And when Jesus does return, will he find faith in us? How's your prayer life? Do you pray consistently? Do we pray humbly? Do we pray boldly? Are we praying desperately? We need to be praying consistently and humbly and boldly and desperately because we need to realize we need a Savior. We need a Savior because we have sinned. We need a Savior because we could do nothing about our sin. And yet God could. And he sent his son to come to earth, to die on a cross, to bear the weight of our guilt and our shame and our punishment, to die on that cross, to be raised from the dead, to be exalted to the right hand of the Father. And he now calls us to pray always and don't give up. Maybe you're here this morning and you're a disciple of Christ, but you've walked away. There's a sin in your life that you're struggling with and you need the prayers of the saints. You need this church family to pray for you, to pray with you, to beg God to forgive you. God answers prayers and he stands ready to forgive you this morning. But maybe you're here today and you've never obeyed the gospel. You've never cried out to God. You've never asked him to forgive you. You've never turned to him and committed your life to Christ. There's no better time than today, this morning, than to make your life right with God. Leaving here, glorifying his name throughout all the earth. Living for him in all eternity. Praising his name. He's coming again. Are you ready? If we can help you with anything, please let us know while together we stand and sing.